Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com, where you can find over 100 episodes about research computing, scientific computing, and other topics. I have again here Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, what's going on? Hey, Brock. Uh, today, we actually have one of my colleagues from the OpenMPI community here today to talk about what kind of started as a sub-project, but has grown into an entire community and project uh, unto itself. So I think I'm just going to jump right in here and say, uh, Ralph, I wonder if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Ralph Castain. I'm a principal engineer from Intel Corporation. I've uh, been working on OpenMPI with Jeff for a long time now, and we, are, uh, we started this PMIX community that Jeff asked me to come here and talk about today. All right, so Ralph, uh, you, you said the keyword right there, PMIX. Uh, why don't you give us the two-minute version? What What is it? Yeah, so it, it, PMIX stands for PMI Exascale, Process Management in, in, Interface Exascale. And basically what it is, it's a, it's a standardized way for applications to interact with the system management stack, like the resource manager and things like that, you know, to request services of various types and, uh, and be able to get a response back. So what is the uh, history of PMIX? Because I think there's some other PMIs out there. Yeah, there are. Um, PMI uh, originally started, you know, quite a while back now, uh, as a way of, of having the uh, providing a way for applications to wire themselves up. So uh, they'd be able to exchange addressing information, basically, to say, "How do I talk to you?" Um, but at, over time, what happened was that the uh, the needs grew to where you, the application needed to be able to interact over broader topics, and so. Uh, PMIX kind of grew from that as a response to that to say, let's give you more ways to interact. Okay, so you said a second ago that this is dealing with resource managers. I assume you're talking about like Torque and Slurm and LSF and all the others that are out there. But, but what exactly does that mean? What, what does an application need to get from resource managers? So there's, there's really two things or two types of things that they do. Uh, first off, when you're launching, a resource manager can provide you with all kinds of information about your job that's really helpful when you're trying to optimize communications and, and collective operations. So they can tell you, uh, you know, where all the your your peers are located, uh, what uh, addresses they have, etc. That's information you can get at the very beginning, so you don't have to exchange it afterwards. Then the other things that you you know that you want to do is. For example, you might want to ask for additional allocations of resources or, uh, or maybe you want to spawn additional processes. So there are these kinds of services, uh, you know, what is, what's the status of queues and things like that, that applications as they're evolving really want to be able to do. And so in my limited worldview here, I, I think of this as applicable to MPI applications. And so when you talk about wire up and communications and things like that, you're referring to uh, MPI applications of any scale, honestly, from you know two processes to uh, two million processes that when they start up, they need to exchange MPI addressing stuff to get their Ethernet addresses or their InfiniBand addresses or their whatever type of networking addresses so that if I MPI send to you then I know how to open a network channel to you. That's the kind of stuff you're talking about? Yeah, in part. Um, that certainly is, is in there. But it's also applicable to non-MPI processes. So um, let me give you an example. Say I, I'm in a cloud and, uh, and I'm running an application. It doesn't have to be an MPI application, any application in the cloud. Well, there are things like, for example, when, when I get started, I can use PMIX to communicate to the cloud manager that I'm willing to be preempted. Um, and that now can be a, a service kind of thing, you know, where, hey, if you're willing to be preempted, you get a different rate on, on your charges. So I can now announce to the, to, the, uh, to the cloud manager that I'm willing to be preempted, and then I can use the PMIX mechanisms that the cloud manager can tell me, hey, I need to preempt you now and wait for me to say back that I'm ready uh, so I can go ahead and checkpoint my job or do whatever I need to do. Uh, to prepare for it, and then I get to tell the cloud manager back, you know, I'm ready to be preempted now. So there's a whole bunch of things like that that you can do that's got nothing to do with MPI. 
So is this almost like a operating kind of like a message bus where different clients can basically say this is what I'm able or willing to do? Exactly right. Uh, one of the uh, mantras we have in the PMIX world is that PMIX does nothing. All it does is it communicates your request to the local system management stack and returns the response back. So that, that management stack always has the right to say, you know, nice, I, I'm glad you asked that, but I don't support it. And you have to have there in your application some, you know, mechanism for dealing with a not supported response. But, but all the things, you know, people talk about flexible workflows and the ability, you know, to manage their own environment better and stuff. We just provided the, the, the hooks by which you can do that. So is this done like a core plus extensions? Like if my client doesn't know about something, like how it, it seems like you could keep adding more and more information that you could be announcing that you're capable of doing or communicating with. Uh, how do you make sure that things can remain compatible between adding more and more things being mentioned or announced? Well, we, uh, we adopted an architecture that says uh, we have very, very simple APIs. And uh, it's like job control, where you announce, for example, that I am uh, preemptible. There's just one job control API. And then you can provide uh, a, an array of key value attributes to that, to that API that actually you know, uh, describe what the, uh, the operation that you want to do. So, you know, if we want to uh, extend the kind of things that you can do, like if for a job control, I want to add something beyond just, you know, uh, announcing that I'm preemptible or whatever. We don't change the API. We don't add another API. We just give you a new key value attribute that you can pass. And so that, that's how we maintain backward compatibility. Uh, we just, we don't, we have a, just a policy. We do not add APIs unless there simply is nothing that fits, and then we'll add one. So what exactly is the big deal here? Because way back at the beginning, and again, I'm, I'm admittedly taking a limited worldview of, MP, of MPI applications, but I understand this applies well beyond that as well. But we used to just do SSH and uh, pass things on the command line. Like if I want to start a 32 process or 128 process MPI job, we could just do uh, SSH and maybe do that a little smartly, maybe via a tree or something so that it wasn't linear. Um, why why do we need all this extra control stuff um, of what used to be a, a relatively straightforward process? Well, okay, so there's 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 two different parts to that. Uh, one is you know if you're looking at an MPI job, which I know is is your your focus, Jeff. The uh, the problem is there's only so much you can pass on a, on a command line, and so. Uh, as your job gets bigger or as the amount of information that you want to pass uh, gets larger, you, you just can't fit it on the command line anymore. And so you need some secondary mechanism for, for, making that, uh, for passing that information around. What we used to do was, uh, was the PMI approach, right, which was to say, well, we'll take, you know, everybody will, since we have a limit on the, on the command line, we only use the command line for what we have to, and then everybody simply broadcasts that, and then there's some you know, out-of-band mechanism by which it gets exchanged. Um, and that has all the scaling issues. And so that's why we went this way, is saying, well, let's, let's get back to that basic thing. Give a mechanism by which the resource manager can convey that information to you uh, outside of the command line limitations. Okay, so this is a way for applications to talk to the resource manager, but how does that address that I'm process A and I want to communicate with process B and I, therefore I need to know some kind of network address for process B? How does that work? So, uh, yeah, so the way we did that in the past, right, was that process A would discover a network address, he would broadcast it to everybody, and process B would then receive that broadcast and say, oh, okay, I can communicate to you. What we've done is that when the resource manager is getting ready to start the job, we've given them a, an API, a, a function they can call, that will talk to the network and find out what are the addresses that are going to be used by the different processes. What nodes are they going to be on and what addresses are they going to be assigned to? 
And then we include that in the information that's given to every process when it first starts up. And so when the, when the process first starts up, process A starts up, it can ask, what's the address for process B? And it already has that information there. So is this something for end users or is this just something for like creators of MPI libraries like OpenMPI and other types of higher level tools that users interact with? And it's just between the creators of those middleware projects and um, the resource managers or is this something that a user can directly interact with? Yeah, it's really both. I, 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 the, so the libraries, uh, you know, open it, the MPI libraries, the uh, open Shmem libraries, et cetera, uh, they embed interactions uh, that that use these PMIX uh, interfaces to do their basic, you know, wire up and and uh, other operations that they do. But then the application developers themselves are using it. Because they're the ones who know how they want, you know, that their application has certain workflow requirements. You know, they want to be able to allocate more new resources or whatever they want to do. They use it uh, directly themselves. And then you are seeing people embed it in tools. So, you know, for example, if I might have, write this tool that allows me to launch jobs and says certain command line options and everything that I really like, in the past you'd write that, but it, it would be specific to the resource manager that you were locally using. Now you can write it with PMIX instead and take that same software and simply move it from one resource manager environment to another without having to change any of the code. Okay, so this is really talking about just having a portable standard API that multiple resource managers and middleware developers can develop to? Correct. Okay, so this does not necessarily replace something like, let's say, the task manager, you know, TM spawn inside something like one of the PBS derivatives out there because PMIX doesn't actually, again, do anything, but now OpenMPI doesn't develop to TM spawn and all the other different interfaces out there. They just develop to PMIX. That's exactly correct, yeah. yeah. OpenMPI calls... PMIX spawn, and PMIX takes care of the abstraction for it. So just to nail this down then, you're saying PMIX is a library. Is that right? It's actually three pieces. Uh, first, there's, a, <clears throat> there's an actual standard, and, uh, and that just defines the APIs and, and, uh, and defines a set of attributes, you know, key value attributes, uh, that we all agreed that we would support or at least recognize. But that says nothing in it at all about implementation, and people are always free to implement it themselves. Um, the second piece is an actual reference implementation. That's a complete library, both client and server, and uh, that fully implements all the, all the PMIX uh, function calls. So again, all it does is communicate. So the client function calls communicate to the server function calls that then call the relevant backend uh, uh, resource manager functions uh, to actually do something. Then the third piece, we actually have a reference server. It's, uh, it's, it's about a, a runtime, if you will. It looks just like a resource manager uh, that supports PMIX with the exception that it doesn't have a scheduler in it. And so if somebody wants, for example, to develop some uh, PMIX-based code in an environment that doesn't yet support PMIX itself, they can run this reference server in that environment, and it, it operates just as if it was sitting in a PMIX uh, resource manager, um, except for, like I said, it doesn't do scheduling. So those three elements are what we mean when we talk about the PMIX uh, community. Okay, so you're, you're then also implying here that the resource managers out there are also supporting PIMIX directly. Is that a correct inference? They are. Um, some of them already do. Uh, Slurm, for example, has been doing it for, uh, for a year and a half now. And uh, IBM has been developing their job step manager. Uh, and that, that is you know, really based on PIMIX uh, or PMIX all, all across the board. And others are coming along uh, at various stages. So, yeah, eventually we we do hope that uh, that most of the, if not all of the resource managers out there, will in fact provide that support directly. 
Now, that's actually a, a, a pretty fascinating place then that if applications have um, one, you know, a standard that they can write to to do their large-scale applications, like MPI is one of the biggest, but there are others out there. And then also the runtimes have a standard to talk to the back-end schedulers. Well, that would also be fantastic because, as you and I both know, maintaining um, you know, the MPI implementation to talk to all these different resource managers who have different abstractions and different APIs and whatnot, it was kind of a nightmare. So since this is a, a, a fairly large disruption in this community, how did you manage to pull this off? Well, um, the, you know, being, having some role in open MPI obviously put me in contact with a lot of these people to begin with. Like you said, we had to talk to them because of, of the infra interfaces we had to provide. So there was some personal contact uh, involved in that as well. But the, uh, you know, the, the real thing was that this was a need that all of us that were involved in these communities, you know, the resource manager folks, et cetera, we all knew we needed to do something. And some of the resource manager folks had already been starting to write proprietary uh, responses to it, which was what you know, was causing a lot of consternation in the user community because you kind of had to lock your application then into that environment, which is you know, something people really don't like to do. So it was, a, it was a recognized need out there. And the real key thing, I believe, in, in that, that let us get the adoption by the resource manager guys uh, was the, the stipulation that, um, that the resource manager always has the right to say not supported. So, uh, so you know, if you don't want to, for example, say you don't want to support a particular back-end capability, you just provide a null in that function pointer, and the PIMIX server, if it gets a request for that, will see the null on the back end and just return a not supported for you. So you don't have to do anything. Uh, if you if you want to support that, cap that, that function, but maybe you don't support every option that somebody could pass, well, you have the right to be able to look at those options and say, you know, I'm sorry, I don't support that, and reply back. So... I think that not supported ability uh, was the thing. It was one of the key things. So a second part of this inference uh, of you know the, the the resource managers supporting Pemex natively are they writing their own code, uh, their own implementation from scratch, or are they using your reference implementation? And then as a consequence of that, is there a standardized network protocol that you use? Because then you can divorce the software implementation from what is communicated across the network. So uh, they're all free to write their own code. So far, nobody has done that, and there's no indications that somebody wants to do that. Um, the, we, did not, we did not standardize the protocol between the client and the server. So if somebody writes their own and, uh, it, and it's incompatible, well, that's, you, know, you just have to make sure that you link against this, the, the same client library that they used. You know, they have to provide both a server and a client library, but the APIs would be the same to be compatible. Um, like I say, so far nobody has gone that route. Uh, it's a lot of code to write, and uh, nobody has seen a proprietary or a competitive advantage, I should say, in implementing their own. The competitive, what, what's happened is then is that the competitive basis between the resource environments has shifted from the APIs to what level, you know, which APIs they support on the back end and which ones they don't. Okay, so one of the goals of PMIX is, you know, you've got Exascale right in the name of it. Um, what exactly does PMIX bring to the table if it doesn't actually do anything that gets you that extreme scale? Well, the it's really, again, in, in two pieces, if you will. Uh, the exascale uh, requires uh, that you be able to, you know, be able, first off, you have to be able to launch the job in a, in a reasonable amount of time. If you, if you just took the current method of broadcasting and, and sharing things, you know, an exascale machine might take, you know, tens of minutes to start up a job that size. And that's obviously, that's something you really don't, would not like to see. So, um, 
part of that is uh, is the ability to then have the resource manager share the information that it already has. I mean, when we went back and looked at what was actually being broadcast around, it turned out that more than 90% of that information, the resource manager already knew. But it didn't have a mechanism, a standardized mechanism, by which it could share it to the application. So either the application had to come up with a, you know, a, a resource manager-specific way of dealing with that communication, or we had to standardize it so the, the library could be portable. And so we took the approach of saying, look, the resource manager already knows a lot of this stuff. Let's go ahead and just give them a standardized way of communicating it. Then the second half of that was we had to go to the resource manager guys and say, there's an additional 10% of the information that we would need. And if we had that, we wouldn't have to broadcast anything. And we had to get them to agree to provide that 10%. And, and uh, that's what we were able to do, finally, is to get, a, is get a, a commitment from them. And so we created a list. It's on the web. Uh, that uh, has, Here's a list of all the stuff we need. And the resource manager guys are going through and filling that list in. So aren't you just moving like all the startup time from the MPI, you know, like runtime, you know, wire up, whatever you guys call that very first step to get everything going. Aren't you just shifting that problem to the resource manager? How, you know, normally it's not the individual nodes on, you know, resource, whatever the resource manager has run on the individual nodes, it has a lot of this information, right? Like how, I'm not seeing yet quite how this actually benefits if if all the information is still just kind of held in one place on one part and it's just now in the resource manager. Okay, well, let's, let's take the, um, the endpoint information as an example. So uh, the way it works today or in the past has been that, uh, the application process starts. It 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 discovers a resource. Let's just, let's use sockets as an example. It opens a socket and gets a socket ID, a uh, socket number, and then it has to broadcast that because none of its peers know what socket it's listening on. So one way you could address that was be to assign static sockets to your processes, and then you don't need to exchange the socket information anymore because you can compute what socket they're on. But the problem is that you might not be the only application running on that node, and so you don't know what sockets you can actually take. So what we now do is we say, okay, resource manager, you use the PMIX uh, plugin for the for Fabric. That plugin will manage a pool of sockets based on its knowledge of what's being run across the, across the different uh, jobs, across different nodes, and it will use that to assign static uh, socket numbers for this app for this application those numbers then are included when the resource manager sends its launch message out to the to the compute nodes that information goes along with it so instead of having an exchange uh, the daemons are given before they even start the local processes they are given all that endpoint information and they just simply convey it down to their local clients and that eliminates the need for each client to broadcast that information. So if you go through and you look at what, what pieces of information the different libraries are asking for, uh, you make that laundry list up, and, uh, and then you ask the resource manager, the workload manager, when it sends the launch message out to the individual nodes, you ask it to include all that information for every node in that message. And so now you just use TCP sockets as an example, and that's kind of a, a baseline, but uh, many more high-end uh, HPC environments, for example, use other types of networking, and there are several available. So this, that, I just want to clarify, that TCP was just an example. You can do the same thing regardless of the back-end type of network, right? That's correct, and we already do. Um support those uh, at least at least all of the uh, the most popular ones uh but basically yeah that's right you you know the the uh the network interface support in PMIX and the server side is just a set of plugins so they're plugins you know for all your favorite flavors of, of fabric and we in those plugins we've worked with the network manufacturers to get those plugins available and those plugins are all now capable of creating those addresses for you and so just to drill down on this a little bit more, so not only 
are you making the data available? Let me just provide one thing that was kind of an inference there was that when you say it's sent out to the daemons, you mean it's sent once to each, uh, let's just say node or server on the network, even though that's kind of an amorphous term, but like once. And then if you've got 20 or 30 or 40 or more cores on that server, that daemon receives the information once and can locally give that information to all of the processes that start up, whether it's 20, 30, or 40, using local IPC, not networking IPC, right? That's one of the wins? That is one of the wins. That's correct. All right. And then additionally, on top of that, you also do some compression types of techniques in the launch message that's sent via PIMIX, right? Well, the PIMIX doesn't send the launch message. The resource manager does. We just provide the information for them that we say, look, this information needs to go along. Uh, here's a payload that has all the information that we need you to take along. Uh, you'd be surprised. It, it, the information is not as big as you might think. Our typical launch message, uh, our PMIX-enabled launch message from like Slurm, for example, is less than a megabyte. Because there's so much, uh, you know, we compress obviously anything we're going to provide up to Slurm. Slurm just gets it as a as a blob and just sends it along. But you know, Slurm use you know other and the re, all the resource managers do. They use like regular expressions to describe where the processes are located and things to try and keep the the launch message down. So it really is only about a megabyte in size or so, even for an exascale size machine. Ah, that was that was my next question. So a megabyte for how many, like, what, what scale, how many processes are you talking there? Well, we've been launching, uh, in, our, in our biggest test cases, uh, a million processes on, like, 30,000 nodes. And that, that's about, you know, about one, one and a half megabyte launch message. So it's not very big. So what about use cases besides uh, MPI? I know that's where this kind of started, but you also talked about, you know, on cloud, how you could say you're preemptible. Has there been any implementations um, that kind of touch on one of those other examples? Uh, yeah, uh, there are. The um, and I, I I apologize that I cannot. I'm not at liberty to give you you know names and details, but uh, because those companies haven't taken it you know public yet. But but there are people working on uh, you know cloud uh, interactions like we talked about earlier. There are also people working on uh, different kinds of tools, you know, uh, that, that that can take advantage of it. You know, debugger tools, et cetera, that can use these kind of interfaces to do more than they do today. Uh, for example, on a debugger, uh, today you get a a node level representation of where everything is, and uh, and there's a limited amount of, of you know of information that you can provide because the interface is limited. So. But with a PMIX interface, you could ask, for example, to show the nodes in a network-based layout. You know, where are they on the network relative to each other? The processes, I should say. Where they are relative on the network to each other. You could ask the fabric for traffic reports and show where choke points are. Because the interfaces allow you to be able to make that query to the system management stack and be able to get that kind of information back. Now you said something a, a minute ago that I kind of want to dive into a little bit. You said you were testing at a million processes. How do you test at that scale? Well, we have uh, uh, friendly users at uh, who, at facilities that have these kind of big machines, and uh, they will generally take a little bit of time out and run some tests for us, which has been very much appreciated. We also have ways to simulate scale. So, for example, we can launch multiple processes on a, on a given uh, node and make them look like they're sitting on different nodes. And so um, uh, one of our, our collaborators uh, was kind enough to do that on Amazon, where he, in fact, takes a small number of Amazon nodes but makes it look, from a PMIX standpoint, like a much, much bigger cluster. And we can do some scaling tests on that that, May not be, you know, fully uh, realistic in terms of a cluster, but gives some pretty good scaling law measurements. Uh, so we, so we have ways of getting that information even when we can't get a hold of the big clusters. So could PMIX help in heterogeneous environments? By this I mean, what if I have, a, you know, hybrid systems are popping up all over the place where you have, sometimes you have accelerators in nodes, you might have FPGAs are coming back on the market as alternative types and you know, like for me at the University of Michigan, our cluster has 
different machines of different architecture types with different accelerators. Is this a way that a given application could basically optimize for whatever machine it landed on by asking the system, do you have these things I know about? Yeah, you could query what you know what resources are available to me. Um, there are there are coordination uh, uh, mechanisms in PMIX that might allow you, for example, to say, well, if I I don't see or I have only you know, four GPUs on my machine, uh, how many have you got on yours? Oh, well, maybe then we use a coordinate we handshake and let you go ahead and run something over there. So there are these mechanisms in place. I, I don't think that everybody, that we have really fully understood everything we can do with PMIX. Uh, the community has been trying to come up with, you know, just trying to enable people to experiment with it. And then the expectation is that people are going to do things with it that are beyond anything we had in mind. But that feedback will come in and then we'll be able to perhaps offer better mechanisms for them to do some of those things. But I, I think this is you know, we've never had this kind of capability before, to be honest with you. And we're kind of feeling our way at the moment to say, well, you know, is this is this useful to you and how might you use it? Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, the community will have a chance to try and test those things out. So you had mentioned earlier, too, that, you know, you could ask the fabric, you know, how congested you are in different places. And with more complex fabrics, especially on the bigger systems, it's definitely useful. But even on regular systems, we might have, you know, in, you know, fabric islands or you might have a dual fat tree or something like that. Um, is there a way or is anybody doing anything where you could effectively choose, say, an optimized collective operation between hosts based on, you know, effectively the fabric architecture, which, again, the application can find out about by asking through one of these standard interfaces? I, uh, I, I don't think anybody has done that yet. Again, uh, I think that's one of those things that uh, what we're looking to see is, you know, given the given people uh, these tools that they can do that, we expect researchers in particular to start asking those kind of questions. And I believe that there are groups, in fact, that are starting to ask exactly that kind of a question about the collective optimization. Uh, but I don't think they have published anything yet. And this really only goes one direction right now. And by that, I mean if an application encounters an error condition that is could be system related. Uh, think of like the PBS health check. I can't use the PMI interface to send information back to the resource manager or to some sort of metric system or something like that. Uh, well, you can. There's there's two ways that you can do that. Uh, one is you could just raise an event, and uh, and we support complete binary. Uh, pa uh, payloads and we actually take care of heterogeneity for you so you can put binary numbers in there whatever you want to do and then the event when you raise it uh, you have the ability to pass however much information you want in there so you could raise an event to the resource manager saying hey I saw something here's a complete blob of information about it um, and then the resource manager can do something with that Obviously, you have to have some kind of a of, of a agreement with the resource manager that a you're going to listen for that event and b you know have some idea what you're going to do with it. But uh, but you also have the ability to uh, to log. So one of the things people asked for was they said, well, I, you know, if I see something or if I just want to even log that I have a certain amount of progress, and I want to stick that in my job record. So uh, you know, every resource manager keeps a record of the job that you can go back and look at, see what happened. Um, you can actually insert messages into that log uh, from the application, and that way, you know, there's a, when you get the official uh, job record of what the job was, did, you know, how much resources it used, et cetera, those messages will be there for you. So you can record them for yourself, or you can try and communicate them to the resource manager. Now, one thing you've been very consistent about uh, through this whole discussion is you've been saying a lot of we and the community this and the community that. Who is involved in the community? Well, uh, you know, Intel, obviously, through me, and then there's uh, Mellanox is with us on IBM. Uh, are, those three are probably the biggest uh, code contributors at the moment. But, we, you know, we have a, a list of others. You know, Fujitsu's involved, uh, folks from RIST. Uh, we have uh, Livermore and Los Alamos uh, from the National Lab community that have been involved. Uh, and then there's been, 
you know, Slurm, the SCEDMD guys, the Altair PBS guys have been there. So there's there's a and I'm probably leaving some folks out that I'll have to apologize to afterwards because there's about about 12 to 15 active members at this point in time. And these are members who, like you, you mentioned, uh, the first several of them were code contributors to the the open source PIMIX code base itself. But these other members are helping to shape the standard, right? I mean, it's not just about contributing code, right? That's right. That's right. The, uh, the every, everybody participates. All of those people participate in the uh, in the standards process, which is based on the IETF mechanism. So there's always an RFC that that has to be you know backed up by a prototype implementation, which is usually in the reference library. It doesn't have to be, uh, but it has to be visible. And then uh, it goes through review. It goes through uh, uh, comments, and then. Uh, we have weekly teleconferences, and uh, at those weekly teleconferences, we schedule and and have a a review of those those proposals, and then those things get accepted or rejected, usually accepted into the standard. So all those groups participate in that. Okay, so this really is quite a bit more than just Ralph's little toy. This is a, a full on community that is full of all the interested parties uh, across this vertical, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, it really is a lot more than than, than me, and uh, and, and you know, I should give credit to everybody that's involved. Is it's a lot of work from everybody's standpoint. You know, part of it, which you have to understand, is that you know, it, it's you, you can create this channel by which these two parties can communicate, but there's a lot of work behind the scenes that has to happen that the resource manager guys have to agree they're going to provide. And then, you know, like, for example, you have to go to the fabric people and say, hey, guys, we need you to provide this this endpoint information blob, et cetera. That's work on their part that they have to do to provide that information. Or if you're going to talk to the file system guys and you say, well, you know, we need you to be able to pre-cache files for us and we tell you or tell us how long it's going to take them to to be retrieved. That's work they have to do. So uh, it's really a collaboration across all these different elements that makes it possible. So it seems very flexible. What's the strangest or probably in this case more unexpected um, use of PMIX you've seen thus far? Uh, the one that surprised me the most was a request really from the um, from the cloud, some people working in the cloud world where they wanted to be able to loan, I think I mentioned this earlier, they want to be able to loan resources back so uh, they actually have workflows where they they you know they they need a an envelope of resources uh, eventually at some points in their computation or their work, but there are times when they don't need it, don't need all of it, and you know so I I had never anticipated somebody actually loaning resources back to the system and then getting them back later. Uh, that that to me was a surprise. That last point was one I really wanted to get across. It really involves all these different parties actively collaborating. Um, Cause that's, what's really different in my mind with Pimix versus before is, it's the first time I'm aware at least of, you know, the resource manager, the fabric, the, the file system, the library guys, language library guys, all getting on a weekly telecon collaborating on how they're going to orchestrate this application environment. All right, so there's a lot of open source code here. Um, you must have a fairly permissive license that you distribute this under because some of these resource managers are uh, closed source and proprietary. What what license are you using? We use the three clause BSD, so it, it's uh, it's absorbable by people using you know a GNU license as uh, as well as um, you know proprietary people. They're all welcome to use it. So, uh, Ralph, thanks a lot for your time. Where can people find out more about PMIX and get involved? The Probably the first place to start would be going to GitHub. Everything's on GitHub for PMIX. So the uh, the reference page for for uh, PMIX itself is pmix.github.io slash PMIX. Oh, or you can go to the code repository itself. Uh, there's a group because we have both the uh, implementation as well as the uh, reference server there and that's at github.com slash pmix okay Ralph thanks a lot for your time 
Thanks, Ralph. Hey. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. <laughs>